Hello everyone and welcome to episode three of season one of A Race in Society, where we're focusing on race and COVID-19. My name is Alika Zavalos and my co-host Alana Lenton is behind the scenes this week. We broadcast on our YouTube every two weeks, so please remember to subscribe so that you get notified about our upcoming sessions. This week we're talking about media representations and COVID-19. Before we begin, I acknowledge that I live on the lands of the Wongal people of the Eora Nation and I work on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. One of the outcomes of colonization and the accompanying racial rule is the control of public narratives by non-Indigenous settlers. The result is a lack of attention to the ways in which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people interpret the world. Aboriginal people have been telling stories for over 65,000 years and we honour this expertise and wisdom. Thinking about today, we see that it's important to consider the role that the media has played in framing public discussions of the link between COVID-19 um, and race. Mainstream media creates sensationalist accounts which spread a moral panic about racialized people. A moral panic is when a group or an event is seen as a threat to social values, usually in a time of great social change, such as the pandemic. A moral panic whips up fear of particular groups, especially racial minorities. At the same time, it protects the interests of people at the top of the, high of the racial hierarchy, which in Australia is white people of European descent. Today, our panel is well equipped to shed light on how race plays a role in shaping these narratives. We're going to start off by uh, talking with Dr. Summer May Finlay, who's a public health researcher at the universities of Wollongong and Canberra. Summer, you recently co-authored an article for the Australian and New Zealand Journal of Public Health, focusing on the leadership of Aboriginal community controlled health organisations in COVID-19. Can you tell us more about these community led organisations and how they've effectively used social marketing campaigns? And can you also tell us about why it's important for government to properly finance and support culturally appropriate resources during the pandemic? Thanks for that and thanks for having me. And before I actually answer the question, I just also want to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land I'm on today. I'm on Wadi Wadi country in Wollongong. It is beautiful country and I'm eternally grateful for the ancestors for taking care of this country that is not my own and for allowing me to work and walk on this country. So, as you said, I co-authored an article with uh, Dr. Mark Wenatal. He is a fantastic man who has, is continuing to work in the ATCHO sector. So for those that don't know, ATCHO stands for the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Organisations. And these are organisations that are set up for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So to be an ATCHO, you need to have your board, which is made up of Aboriginal people, and the board is made up of community members, which are also Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. So it's a really, really important organisation within a community. So there is over 140 ATCHOs around the country with over 300 clinics. And for those that don't really know the background of an ATCHO, they were actually, the first one was established in Redford in 1971, and the second one was established, I think, in 1972, down in Fitzroy in, in Melbourne. And they were actually established because these communities saw that their community members were not receiving adequate care in the primary health care sector or within their hospitals. And essentially, that was driven by racism. And now, as I said, we've seen uh, a number of them established in a number of different communities, and there's 140 some odd of them. Now, what we saw within the beginning of the pandemic, even before it was described as a pandemic, as early as February, the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services were gearing up to actually promote key public health messaging to keep their community safe during the pandemic. So the basic principles of um, physical distancing, sanitisation, uh, wearing masks, that started even before the WHO had called this a pandemic because they recognised that their community members were at increased vulnerability, often because of um, multiple chronic diseases, otherwise known as non-communicable diseases. And 
the reason, one of the reasons why the ACHO sector has been so successful, and we know they're successful, because we actually have very few Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have contracted COVID, but also who have passed away from COVID. We know they've been successful, but one of the reasons they were successful is because they know their communities really well. They delivered messages and they were trusted by the community to deliver these messages. And they also are very, very good because as a collective society of communicating using multiple channels. So social media, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are huge uptakers of social media. And it was really important to note that the ACHO sector started communicating well before the Commonwealth actually put out its response. They put out a uh, communication strategy, which was fine, it was great, and it was done by an Aboriginal organisation. But the difference between the national approach and the local approach is that the local approach really understood what motivated that community and how to actually communicate using appropriate languaging, whether that be community like vernacular or whether it was actually using um, uh, traditional languages. And for me, when I think about it, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we know our communities. We know how to actually engage and we know each other and we trust each other. And sometimes the government's just got to get out of the way and, probably, and just actually allocate the funding to the ACHO sector to make sure that they can get on, the, on with the job of taking care of their communities and the government can get on with the job of making sure that they're funded adequately. But we also know that the ACHO sector is heavily, heavily monitored largely, in my opinion, because of a mistrust in Aboriginal organisations that's driven by racism. Thank you, Summer. And I think what strikes me about what you're saying is um, you're the expert on public health, but it is really built on trust. You can't have an effective public health campaign without trust. And one of the things that's been remarkable is uh, we kept hearing this messaging of the vulnerable communities, which is, is not a defect of them. It's actually um, an outcome of racism embedded in um, our healthcare system. And one of these groups was obviously remote Aboriginal commu communities and older Aboriginal people and other um, people with disabilities and um, immunocompromised people. And it is an amazing, uh, success, if you like, that Aboriginal people have been able to keep those numbers down. And it's got to be said that when you look at the outcomes in the aged care sector where so many people have died, which we're, we're losing so much of that link to a generation, all those families are losing important histories. And it is a testament to Aboriginal people's um, expertise in health to have kept those numbers low. Thank you. So um, we wanted to also now come to uh, Dr. Karen Schamberger, who is an independent curator and historian. Due to the early identification of the coronavirus as originating in China and the Australian government's decision to quarantine Chinese return travellers on Christmas Island in March, there's been an upsurge in racism which targets Asian people generally. Karen, can you tell us more about your work on the history of Australian xenophobia and how this uh, anti-Chinese racism could be playing out in current media reports on racism and the COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you, Zuleika, for your question and that generous introduction. I'd also like to um, firstly acknowledge that I live and work on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. Um, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present and acknowledge that, um, that I also live on stolen land and there is much to work through. Um, to give a definition of Sinophobia, I'd like to start by explaining that it is the fear of China, um, its people and or its culture. Um, and my work has primarily looked at an example of anti-Chinese riots during the gold rush period, in particular at Lamming Flat in 1860 to 61. These riots were over land and resources, which was originally taken from the Baramondatory clan of the Wurundjeri nation. The worst of the riots occurred when about 3000 European, American and Australian born miners violently attacked about 2000 Chinese miners and storekeepers on the 30th of June of 1861. 
At the time, the New South Wales colony was positioned within, within the larger British Empire, which along with France and Russia, had signed the Peking Treaty of 1860 with Qing Dynasty China. This treaty enforced trade rules which were to the advantage of Britain and France and enabled the Chinese the reciprocal right to travel wherever they wanted to in the British Empire. So some New South Wales politicians were reluctant to impose restrictions on Chinese immigration. They rejected anti-Chinese immigration legislation twice before passing it in November 1861 after the riots. Media reports about the racial conflict differed according to political opinion. For instance, the Sydney Morning Herald were sympathetic to the Chinese as their stakeholders and audience were the Sydney elite who wanted cheaper Chinese labor, as well as wanting trade with China and good relations with Britain. The Empire newspaper, on the other hand, were anti-Chinese and accused the Chinese of misusing water resources being dirty and diseased, taking the gold to China and not spending money in the colony, and also threatening to make Lamy Flat a Chinese territory. The New South Wales government responded by enacting laws to limit Chinese immigration, imposing a 10 pound poll tax on each Chinese immigrant and segregated the Chinese away from the Europeans on the gold field. The racialized disorder prompted the establishment of the New South Wales Police Force in 1862 and retrospectively became mythologized as the birth of white Australia in the lead up to federation in 1901. It was particularly in this latter period that anti-Chinese sentiments and laws became symbolic of Australia's independence from Britain. They occurred when Western powers in Europe and the Americas felt threatened by the economic development of China and Japan which we're also, we also see playing out in the global pandemic um, today. In terms of Australian government responses to the current pandemic, segregation, border control and financial punishments have again been used to target people of Chinese and also Asian descent, whether Australian citizens, temporary residents or tourists. The government placed Australians of Chinese descent who were in Wuhan, China, on Christmas Island for quarantine when they returned, while Australians who were not of Chinese descent were allowed to disembark from the cruise ship Ruby Princess without being quarantined. All those who arrived by plane were placed in hotels on the Australian mainland for their quarantine period. International students, many of whom are from Asia, whose fees prop up the Australian higher education system were deliberately excluded from financial support with many of them now reliant on charities or informal work to survive if they are in Australia. Many others cannot return to their studies because of the restrictions on travel. Media reporting in Australia has included stories which centre Chinese people's eating habits and wet markets being the source of the virus, as well as stories around Asian stockpiling goods, which we know are false. Australian media has also insensitively used images of Asian people in Australian cities wearing masks to illustrate news stories about the pandemic, even when Asians are not mentioned in the news story itself. The Asian Australian Alliance COVID-19 Racism Report examined 410 reports of interpersonal racism between the 2nd of April and the 2nd of June this year. Osman Chu noted that many of the racial insults directed at Chinese and Asian Australians were around eating habits and Asians being carriers of disease. And these are echoes of 19th century sinophobia that we also know in Australia. Even before travel restrictions came into force, Chinese businesses in the Sydney and Melbourne Chinatowns saw a drop in patronage as customers, both Asian and non-Asian, stayed away. And some of those businesses have now failed. Just as the historical Chinese people have asserted their rights during the gold rush, contemporary Asian Australians are also mobilising. The Asian Australian Alliance has made a number of recommendations in their report, including the implementation of an anti-racism strategy at the federal gov government level, and also better media training around unconscious bias. Thank you.
Thank you, Karen. Um, I'm struck by, uh, I shouldn't be struck, but I, I think something interesting that comes out of what you said is that the initial, this particular early period of um, racism against uh, Chinese people led to the formal establishment of the police force. And again, we see um, again and again, police um, using violence to uh, uh, reinforce racial categories in this country and obviously um, lethally to uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in many ways and certainly again in uh, responses from the public and in um, enforcing public health um, and only um, using that, that force for First Nations people and for racial, other racial minorities. Uh, another thing that I think comes out of um, what I hear you say is the status of the perpetual foreigner where um, migrants are only ever really welcome under very narrow circumstances, which is um, in terms of financial contributions and very quickly um, the invitation is rescinded. Uh, well, thank you both. I wanted to now um, ask you each to comment on a broader um, link um, between what, what we've been talking about in terms of media representation. So if we could start first with Summer and then um, Karen, if you could comment. Um, so Summer, what do you think are the types of race related news stories that journalists should be reporting on? so that we can advance racial justice during this public health emergency? I think what we need to be seeing in Australian media is actually a greater diversity of voices. So we need to be seeing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues. We've just seen the report around the lack of diversity in mainstream media. And I think that is largely one of the issues that we face is there's a lack of understanding of the importance of those voices and also um, the viewpoints may differ from that of particularly white Australians. And we saw that really, really heavily uh, occur during the Black Lives Matter rallies when we, we saw that uh, when, the, when the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander rallies were occurring particularly um, and obviously with other people of colour, it was something that became a really hot topic of conversation and how could people do this when there was a pandemic going on. And then post that, there was a number of reports specifically looking at the handful of people that actually had tested positive who had attended those events, none of which actually contracted COVID during the pandemic. So we actually see this dialogue and this narrative in Australia of this blaming and shaming Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, or there is the deficit approach. So what we really need to be seeing as well is not just the naming and shaming and the blaming and the deficit, but actually talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people like we are, which is not either the demon or the angel, but everything in between. We need to have robust, diverse conversations that not just focus on what's happening in our communities that may not be positive, but also looking at our strengths within our communities, because you don't get to be a population surviving colonisation for as long as we have, if we are not a population of people with extensive strengths. Thank you, Summer. Karen? I think that media reporting um, during the pandemic they should focus on the structural reasons for the spread of the coronavirus amongst um, essential workers, particularly those on temporary visas or those who are casually employed. Not being able to take paid leave or being subjected to unsafe working conditions is not just a problem for those workers, it also becomes a problem for the whole of society. And I think we need much more um, discussion around that in the public sphere. I also think that media reporting should work to counter stereotypes. So rather than focusing on um, aspects when um, people of colour have done something wrong, um, we need to be much more mindful of people's confidentiality and right to anonymity um, and actually be tried in the courts rather than by media. And I am referring to the two African women um, who 
whose names were splashed all over the newspapers. I think there needs to be a much more um, consideration around what happens to people. I also think that governments need to be held to be account to account by the media when they are when they appear to be making decisions based on race. So, for instance, um, placing the Chinese um, placing Australians of Chinese descent over in Christmas Island rather than treating them the same as every other um, Australian returning from overseas. I think that needs to be pointed out and discussed much more. Um, and I also think that the media could um, also do with some anti-racism training itself, but also start promoting work around anti-racism that is happening in the community. Thank you both. And if I could just reflect on um, what, what you've both commented, because it, it, it is amazing um, thinking about the examples that Summer's talked about. And um, it was great, Summer, to hear you talk about having a more um, robust discussion and a robust space for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to um, have disagreements and to talk about different topics um, without it needing to uh, reflect poorly because of course we know that non-Indigenous people disagree all the time in the media and which is encouraged but I was struck by your comment about um, the media moving away from a deficit lens and the example you gave about the Black Lives Matter protests is so potent. Um, last week um, our guests talked about the leadership of Aboriginal women who organised um, such successful rallies um, and it, it's striking that uh, this, this work happens at the grassroots and it, there's such a wealth of expertise and because there, were, there have been no infections that have come from these large gatherings but we're seeing them in institutions that are run by government. I think um, there's, a, there's such a wealth of knowledge um, that the media ignores rather than thinking about, well, um, the leadership of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, we tend to focus, non-Indigenous people tend to focus on um, the negative. So thank you for, for your insights. And Karen, your comments around um, the ethics of media um, is very interesting and the lack of training um, of, of the media. The media tends to reproduce um, race categories without actually um, interrogating who controls those narratives and how the media itself perpetuates them. So thank you for your, re your reflections. One of the aims of our series is to um, draw on the expertise of um, experts like yourselves so that we can stop thinking of race isn't just a slur. It's not just racism, the interpersonal racism. It is a system um, and it is institutional, including in media and in other institutions like in health. Um, so thank you so much for um, your time and um, your insights. And thank you to everybody else who's watching us at home. Remember once again to just uh, subscribe to our channel so that you can get uh, updates for our upcoming videos. And next time we'll be featuring Ashley Kearney from the First People's Disability Network. We'll also speak with Professor Lylan Bandler from the Leaders in Medical Education Network and Professor John Gilroy from the University of Sydney. And we're going to talk about lockdown, healthcare and ableism. So until next time, please take care.